So here is a map of the results of the treaties of Tordesillas and uh, Saragossa. And you can see by the colors that by and large, it actually divided the Portuguese and the Spanish colonies. Uh, the blue is the uh, Portuguese, the red is the Spanish. You'll see the one exception to this <clears throat> is a very important colony of the Philippines uh, in Spain, which is in the area that was given basically to Portugal. Nonetheless, they, uh, they took over the Philippines. It's interesting, this is, this, is a, this is a map from 1598 when Philip II was a Holy Roman Emperor as well as King of Spain and King of Portugal. And you can see the various parts of Europe, which also belong to Philip II. So this is sort of the largest empire really before the British Empire uh, took over most of the world. And by 1520, that is 22 years after Vasco da Gama first reached India, um, they had a colony in Goa, which is on the west coast of India. They had also taken over Muscat and Hormuz and the Persian Gulf and Malacca and the Straits of Malaysia, which is the, the gateway to the, uh, the Far East. There's even some indication, although it's argued about that uh, they had uh, been, they were the first Europeans to uh, get sight of Australia. They didn't make very much of that, but they probably hit Australia at some point. Now in 1580, the, uh, there was what was called the Iberian Union. Uh, the original royal family of Portugal died out at that point, and the Spanish uh, king became king also of Portugal. And uh, shortly thereafter, you began a long series of wars between the Dutch and the Portuguese, because uh, the Dutch and the, the Spanish, the Portuguese were first colonizers, <clears throat> then the Spanish, and then the Dutch came in. And so a great deal of the 17th century considered uh, uh, wars between the Dutch and other uh, colonial powers over who, who got what. So this uh, somewhat impoverished Portugal because they lost their minority of the spice trade in the Indian Ocean. And in fact, the whole Iberian uh, economy collapsed in 1627. But in 1640, John IV, whose picture you see here to the left, um, started a new separate crown of uh, Portugal. And the last thing is very interesting in that um, Brazil is very Portuguese. Uh, most of the, the colonies did not have a large number of Portuguese settlers. But uh, in the 18th century, there was a big gold rush in Brazil and 600,000 Portuguese moved to Brazil. Here's our first stamp. This is the stamp of the Marcos of Pombal. This is a, a postal tax stamp uh, issued only for the colonies. And he was uh, what they call an enlightened dictator. Uh, under one under under the particular king at that point. Um, during the Napoleonic Wars, all sorts of strange things happened in Portugal. And in fact, from 1808 to 1821, Rio de Janeiro was the capital of Portugal. The uh, the king who proclaimed himself an emperor um, set up his capital there because of the problems in uh, Portugal itself. Uh, and and after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, they started expanding extensively in Angola and Mozambique, and then added Macau and Timor, which were further east um, to their colonial empire. But in 1822, um, this strange thing of Brazil and Portugal being uh, somehow linked um, didn't work very well, and the, the Brazilians uh, declared their independence from Portugal along with, of course, the rest of Spanish America. This is the same period in which Spanish America became independent. And uh, following this, there were what they called the liberal wars of succession, question of who would be king, and it was very complicated. I won't get into that at all, but uh, they ended up, instead of having a republic, they set up a constitutional monarchy in Portugal. And these were the five kings of that monarchy, Queen Maria II, issued four stamps, King Pedro V issued six stamps, King Louise had a fairly long reign, but there was only uh, 55 stamps that were issued in his reign. And most of the stamps we have 
were issued by King Carlos. And he had another period in there when there was a uh, another dictatorship like uh, Pombal's. And finally, the last king of, of Portugal was King Manuel II. The colonies of Angola and Mozambique are on the opposite sides of Africa at approximately the same uh, point. And there was some talk of trying to unify them by having Portugal take over the uh, territories in between. And the British uh, obviously didn't want this. They were engaged in their Cape to Cairo uh, series of colonies. And so uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia, today's uh, countries, Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia, uh, were became British rather than, than Portuguese. The British didn't want the, the Portuguese to block them across Africa. Now in 1902, the country went bankrupt. And we'll see when we get to the stamps, is that you have a whole series of stamps that were overprinted and marked provisorio. Um, because of this bankruptcy and the inflation that, that uh, resulted. And then in October 5th, 1910, there was a coup d'etat, which uh, terminated the monarchy, and you have uh, vast numbers of stamps over uh, Republica. In 1933, uh, this guy Salazar became dictator of uh, Portugal and established what was called the Estado Nova. And he he was in power all the way to 1968, 35 years of, of power. A few years after he died, they had what they called the Carnation Revolution, which uh, involved, among other things, the decolonization. So the Portugal, Portuguese colonies uh, basically went away in 1976. So the only parts that remained in which they became autonomous regions of Portugal were Madeira, and the Azores, the two uh, island groups that are closest to Portugal and which uh, had no native population but had been settled by the Portuguese so very early on. And that's all that's left of the Portuguese uh, colonial empire at the moment. And it's sort of interesting, I find, you'll see the stamps later, but um, some of the last stamps before 1940 are the ones that say uh, the the Portuguese empire. You normally think of an empire, somebody that has an emperor or a king, but this is the Republic declared itself an empire in the, in the late 1930s. Those of you who saw my uh, navigation and commerce uh, presentation, uh, here's another spreadsheet showing all of the Portuguese colonies and uh, which series of stamps were shared by those various colonies. Now, at the top line, um, you'll see that several of the Portuguese colonies at one time or another either changed their name or were divided into smaller colonies. So uh, Angola, there was a little piece of the, 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 the um, thing that appears in the catalog as Portuguese Congo, in fact, uh, became part of Angola. Uh, the Azores at one point was divided into three separate areas and issued their own stamps. Uh, Madeira was for a certain period basically renamed Funchal, Funchal being the largest town uh, on Madeira. Uh, Mozambique is the heavy duty one, all those blue headings are uh, sub-regions, sub-colonies of Mozambique. Um, the the uh, dates that have a, a green background on them indicate that these were stamps of Portugal overprinted with the name of the country. Most of the, most of the stamps of Portuguese colonies have their own name on it, but these particular ones, especially the Azores, uh, <clears throat> Most of the stamps of the Azores are actually Portuguese stamps overprinted. Um, the yellow stamps are, are, are show a pattern uh, during a certain time period where they divided up the existing colonies into subcolonies and issued stamps for them. Uh, the, two, the three red ones are indications of where a particular country in terms of these shared designs uh, had only one shared design. 
and we'll see that <clears throat> several of these uh, countries, uh, Mozambique company, NIASA, um, they look a little thin. The reason for that is that these two countries had their own stamp designs that were not shared with the other colonies. So they're, they're actually fairly interesting. And <clears throat> these blue items here are show that for a brief time, this colony, Zambezia, was split into two separate colonies, sub-colonies, and uh, issued their own stamps for a certain number of years. So I want, I, you know, those are just some of the highlights here. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail and everything. One of the things I try to do with these spreadsheets is to find out patterns. And I had various patterns in the navigation and commerce, but the conclusion I reached with the Portuguese colonies, it was, it was rather haphazard and there aren't any really strong um, patterns to be seen here. There are a number of uh, issues that were issued for almost all the colonies, but uh, that's not true for all of them. And uh, there are a tremendous number of overprints of these various issues for the colonies in Portugal. Um, and they, they do not correspond to one another hardly at all. So it, it was, uh, everybody did their own thing. All right, let's just start going through these. Uh, the, the near colonies belong to what is called Macaronesia. You're probably familiar with the term Micronesia and Melanesia. You would think there would be, might be thinking called Macronesia, but uh, that's not the case. This particular uh, set of islands in the Atlantic Ocean are called Macaronesia. I don't know why they didn't explain the, the origin of the name. And these are all what are called seamounts. They're volcanoes uh, that came from a high ridge in the Atlantic Ocean and, and got above the, uh, the sea and therefore formed islands. And they're all on the African plate. Uh, these Azores is actually the place where the Eurasian, African, and the North American plates uh, collide in the Atlantic Ocean. And these, as I say, they were closest to Portugal. They were, they were, um, encountered and colonized very early on. The only exception here is that the Canary Islands, which were closest to Africa, uh, were early on captured by the Spanish. And here's, uh, here's Madeira. Madeira was the first colony of Europe. Uh, it was settled in 1420. It's uh, 400 kilometers north of the Canary Islands and 520 kilometers east of Morocco. So it's not close to the coast like the Canary Islands are, but it's not as far away as, as we'll see in a moment as the Azores. Uh, the, one of the interesting things about uh, Madeira and the Azores was they were mentioned and shown in various European atlases before they were actually reached and colonized by Portugal. So Madeira was shown in an atlas in 1351 that's almost 70 years before the Portuguese actually settled it. So someone from Europe had gone out there and uh, discovered that these islands existed, but they not much was done about it until the Portuguese started colonizing them. Um, the Madeira colony included the Savage Islands, which were a bunch of very small islands that are geographically part of the Canary Islands. And there are places that doesn't have any good water sources. And in fact, right to the day, um, there's a research group that operates there and there are only a few people there living uh, at any one time. And of course, since they're near the Canary Islands, uh, the Spanish would like to have them, but uh, it hasn't worked out that way yet. And as I say, after the Carnation Revolution and the decolonization, uh, they incorporated Madeira and Azores as the autonomous provinces of Portugal. They are not independent. This is similar to some parts of, for example, the French Empire, uh, Saint Pierre and Miquelon, Reunion, and so on. Are uh, and and the, the Dutch have Suriname, which are considered integral parts of the uh, the metropolitan power. Um, so that's that's the way some decolonization ended. Oh, the Azores weren't settled into about seven years after the uh, Madeira was. They're further away. They're 1,400 kilometers west of Lisbon and 1,500 kilometers northwest of Morocco. Uh, 
And in fact, they're so far out in the Atlantic that it's only like 40% uh, more to uh, Newfoundland and Canada. So they're, they're quite out, uh, far out in the Atlantic. Um, there's evidence uh, that these islands had been uh, settled at some point by the Vikings. You don't think of the Vikings as being down here, but apparently uh, sailing into the Atlantic, they found these islands and settled there for a while. But it, they, there was nobody there when the Portuguese finally actually colonized it. Uh, they were in the European atlases a few years after uh, Madeira. So apparently Madeira was the first thing that uh, the Europeans were aware about in the Atlantic. Um, strangely, um, these islands were overpopulated in the 16th century. I didn't read much more about that, but I found it very interesting that uh, an island should be overpopulated at that period. And it was divided as the uh, spreadsheet showed into three areas. Um, one of them was called, this island is called Horta, and they issued stamps for Horta for a while. Uh, Angra, again, they issued stamps for Angra. I don't know which other islands were part of the Department of Angra. And the third one is Ponta Delgada, which was this end of this particular island. And uh, they did this because um, they reorganized Portugal itself into districts of a certain size or population. And they decided that um, they should do the same thing with the Azores. So for a while you had these uh, three different pieces of the Azores, each with its own stamps. Okay, Mozambique, you will remember that uh, I discussed this a number of months ago when I was talking about the com companies that issued stamps. Well, Mozambique was the uh, biggest mess, if you want to put it that way, of a, of a colony. Um, it was uh, initially discovered uh, by Vasco da Gama in his 1498 voyage. Mozambique, uh, Mozambique is here uh, on this particular peninsula. And that was settled fairly, fairly early on by the Portuguese as a way station on the way to India. And in fact, all of the colonies that the Portuguese had in the Indian Ocean were a part of uh, Portuguese India initially. It's only in 1752 that Mozambique was uh, separated uh, uh, administratively from Portuguese India. And that's one reason why you find stamps of Portuguese India are a bit uh, different than most of the other colonies. They started earlier, they had their own designs. Uh, it's a, a interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, you notice here that the this area named Zambezia was a, uh, a single colony at one point, and at some point, and I don't know when, I, didn't, I haven't found any dates for it, but it was broken into Peta and Kelamana. The Mozambique Company, which I discussed uh, in my presentation on companies issuing stamps, was a large section of uh, Mozambique and issued its own stamps. But it turns out that Nyasa up here and Zambezia itself were also initially colonized by uh, charter companies rather than directly by the Portuguese state. And, and we'll see later that uh, this has some interesting philatelic kind of, uh, results. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, those of you who are familiar with very, very small countries, Kianga is one of the countries that's easy to collect because there are only four stamps for it. And it's, it's this little, this little uh, triangle up here on the far north, which was the sole results of, uh, of Portugal's uh, participation in the First World War. They, they took this little bit of, of uh, coastline from, uh, from the Germans, from Tanganyika. All right, this is the last thing I'm going to show you details about. Um, this is the island of Timor, which is today, the orange part is a uh, part of Indonesia. The green part is an independent country. Um, this is in the east, like I say, the eastern part of uh, what is today Indonesia. This is, these are the areas known as the Spice Islands. Uh, the main trading point other than gold for the colonies was to get to the spices of uh, East Asia and avoid uh, having them go through the Middle East and uh, therefore making more money on it. 
Uh, this is at, at the south southern end of the, uh, the Spice Islands. Um, it was settled by Dominican friars, eventually became a colony of its own. And then in 1874, with the Carnation Revolution, Indonesia invaded uh, the Portuguese parts of Timor. And there was a whole period of about 25 years in which the status of uh, East Timor was unsettled. Finally, the UN became involved and in 2002, they uh, became formally uh, recognized uh, as an independent state. Well, so now we're going to go through the actual stamps, finally. Um, there were four stamps issued uh, during Queen Maria's land. Uh, these established what the Portuguese stamps were gonna look like for quite a while. That is a monochrome stamps with an embossed uh, design in the center. And you can see that when uh, King Pedro became king, they basically uh, took her uh, profile and replaced it with King Pedro's profile. There were a few more stamps issued for Pedro than for Maria, but uh, again, not very many. Now, King Louise, there were even more stamps issued for King Louise, again, of the same sort of uh, style. Uh, this one is the one of the later ones. And if you're familiar with the Portuguese colonies, you know that many of the Portuguese colonies either had this stamp with the colony name overprinted on it, or basically the same design, but with the name of the colony itself on the stamp. These are, these are annoying to collect because of course the embossing tends to uh, come loose sometimes and you have a separation between the, the embossed part of the stamp and the rest of the stamp, which is very annoying. Um, the first design for the colonies, which was shared from several different colonies was this Royal Crown stamp starting in 1870. So that is the first stare, shared uh, shared design for, specifically for the colonies. This was not issued at all for Portugal. Those of you who had much to do with the Portuguese colonies will immediately recognize these stamps, especially the one on the right. Uh, these are the two large series of stamps issued during King Carlos's reign for the colonies. The, the one on the right uh, also exists for Portugal itself, but the design is a little different in that there's no um, area in the upper right for the denomination and the, and the name of the colony is where the denomination appears on the Portuguese version of the stamps. And these stamps were very widely used and when they had to do overprints for one reason or another, it was mostly these stamps that got the overprints. All right, this is the first uh, commemorative set for Portugal or, or its colonies. This is Prince Henry the Navigator. They started at the beginning. They didn't go right to Vasco da Gama, but they did Prince Henry the Navigator. And uh, as you can see, these are the Portuguese stamps overprinted Azores for the Azores. And they, they, this is the only colony which received um, this particular set of stamps. And then there was another Portuguese uh, commemorative issue, St. Anthony of Padua. And again, only uh, the Azores received overprinted stamps. This is the, uh, this is the uh, Portuguese version of the stamps. And these were interesting. I'm sure you're, most of you are aware that the United States for a number of years was printing inscriptions on the back of stamps that said something about what the stamps were. And here, here you in 1895, Portugal was already doing that. It wasn't really an innovation later on. Again, Azores is the only colony that had the Portuguese stamps overprinted, but there were a number of other colonies that also had uh, an issue for St. Anthony of Padua. However, in those colonies, it was uh, not an, it was an overprint on the regular uh, issues current in that colony at that time. Now here, only a few years later, they issued their first Vasco da Gama sets. We'll see several other Vasco da Gama sets. These are one of my favorite sets. I particularly like the stamps that have the, uh, the ships on them. And you'll notice now, this is all oh, this is Azores also. The name Azores is part of the stamp design. It's not an overprint on the Portuguese version of these stamps. Uh, this particular issue, um, there was a, 
this was the only issue of stamps made for Portuguese Africa. Uh, Portuguese Africa was an entity similar to, uh, for example, French colonies. It was an issue that uh, was for use of all the Portuguese uh, colonies in Africa. And that was the, this set is the only set they issued under that, under that name. I believe there are also Portuguese, there are tax stamps for Portuguese Africa, which were overprinted for other colonies. Uh, as I say, Vasco da Gama, the great uh, hero, hero of, uh, of Portugal, there are all sorts of sets uh, for Portugal and its colonies for Vasco da Gama. We'll see a couple of other ones later. As I say, in 1902, there was a terrible period of inflation in, the, in uh, Portugal and Spain, and they had to overprint a whole lot of stamps uh, for the higher values. And here is a, a very common set, what I call the fancy value overprints, uh, where these, these fancy uh, numbers uh, to represent the, the new values. And these were the, the 1892 Carlos stamps overprinted. Then the 1894 stamps at the same time, they uh, issued stamps with the word provisorio over it. I'm not quite sure why they did that. And these are the lower, mostly the lower denomination stamps. These were these are very widely used, it's just like the Carlos basic Carlos stamps. These, these particular overprints are all, all, all over the Portuguese colonies. Now, Manuel II was the last king of Portugal. He was king for less than a year. Um, here is the Portuguese stamp. The Azores were unusual in that they had this basic stamp, but it, it had the word Azores on it. It wasn't an overprint. It was a slightly changed design so that the Azores was, was actually on the stamp. Um, why they changed this practice, the, all the previous issues for the Azores were Portuguese stamps overprinted with uh, Azores. In some colonies, you also had um, this stamp overprinted Republica. It was the last stamp uh, issued or available uh, prior to the, pro the proclamation of the Republic. And so they just uh, overprinted a Republica to deal with uh, the fact that there was no longer a kingdom. And then you also have the, the endless series of overprints, mostly on the 1894 Carlos stamps of Republica. There are several different fonts that were used for this, some of them with serifs, some of them without serifs. Many of them were eventually surcharged. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the earlier stamps, the Louise stamps, for example, also appeared with Republica printed over them. And there's the complications of these are, are very extensive. It went on and on for years before they had their own new Republic stamps. Uh, these that I'm sure you have anyone who's ever gotten any Portuguese stamps, you've seen this particular series. This is the uh, series series. This is the first one in which the denomination and the name of the country were printed in black and the rest of the stamp had some different color. This happened, this was the first um, Republican issue that was widely used, 1912, two years after the, uh, the proclamation of the Republic. Uh, it was, you had a very similar design issued in monochrome. Uh, interestingly, the same year, depending on which particular uh, colony you were dealing with. And here's an example of the San Serif Republica overprints. These are not as common as the ones that have serifs, but uh, there's a, you can see there's a whole series of, in this case, for in Havana, part of uh, Mozambique. This was uh, issued only for Portugal and Mozambique. This is uh, Portugal uh, looking at the Luisada's uh, famous uh, epic poem uh, about Portugal. Only Mozambique had this set along with uh, Portugal itself. And then there was another issue. Uh, Macau, Portuguese Indian Timor had stamps issued in this design, which shows um, Vasco da Gama's flagship San Gabriel. Another Vasco da Gama set issued in 1938, very large number of, of uh, denominations issued for a number of different uh, Portuguese colonies. 
There was also part of this set that wasn't indicated as being airmail, but they were the airmail wraiths, the same, same designs were airmail wraiths as well. And the last, uh, now up through 1940, where uh, the Salazar went on a trip to visit the colonies, and uh, there were two different designs issued for this trip. Again, the, the only stamps in uh, Portugal indicating that it was a Portuguese colonial empire. The one thing I want to point out uh, is that um, the situation of Macau was unusual. Um, they ceased issuing, the Portuguese ceased issuing stamps from Macau in 1976 after the Carnation Revolution. Um, but it was not returned to China until 1999, like Hong Kong. And there are still stamps being issued for Macau, but they're being issued, of course, by uh, uh, the People's Republic of China, but they still say Macau on them. And again, it's, it's in, indicated as an autonomous region of China. India was, was the initial location of um, the important colonies of uh, Portugal and the Indian Ocean that were involved in the spice trade, but they never really moved inland. As you can see here, Goa is the only one on this map that shows uh, territory slightly inland from the, the town on the sea coast. So there were all of these trading stations all up and down the coast of India. Let's say they also had they had Ceylon for a while. Um, this Koshin here at the far other tip of India, that was the first place they built anything. They built a fort there in 1505. 1510, they started selling Goa. And by 1530, Goa was the capital of Portuguese India. Ceylon was for a while, for a fair, almost a century, where it was, the, uh, was a Portuguese colony, but this is one of the areas that the Portuguese lost to the Dutch during the Portuguese-Dutch Wars. 1661, Bombay up here, of course, a major city, and uh, it was given to, in, to England for, during Charles II's reign uh, as a dowry. They gave up this particular colony, they gave it as a dowry, the sort of thing they did back then. Um, Macau and Timor were, event, were, were initially uh, part of Portuguese India, but uh, in, in 1844, just in time to issue stamps, they were separated. And in 1961, um, you'll see a lot of these um, areas were lost in, in, uh, in the 17th century. Um, but the one, there were a number of them left, and India had had enough of uh, the Portuguese having these little enclaves on the uh, shoreline, and they, they seized all of these in, in, in 1961. And during the Carnation Revolution, one of the things they Portuguese said was to admit, yeah, okay, we're giving these up. You can have those now. So are there some countries, as I mentioned earlier, that have only one design? Kianga, that set of four stamps. Kelemane and Teta, parts of Mozambique, they only had one design of, uh, of stamps for a brief period. And uh, Portuguese Guinea, for some reason, they never issued more than one design for that country. Then there were a bunch of sub-countries um, that had only the two Carlos stamps. Those are Angra, Horta, and Porta de Gala, and the Azores, the three parts that they divided it into for a while, and Zambezi itself in, in Mozambique. There were a number of these countries, which you're seeing listed here, which uh, through 1940, they didn't have any uh, anything other really than the various common designs that were used widely in, in the Portuguese colony. So they're sort of boring. Macau had a coat of arms issue and Lorenzo Marcus had a coat of arms issue. Um, Mozambique company um, used very few of the standard Portuguese colonial stamps. They issued their own stamps, which we'll see in a moment, very nice bicolor uh, pictorial series. Nyasa, the same, not quite as interesting as Mozambique. Uh, and Portuguese India, as I said, started earlier and, and uh, had a lot of its own designs 
it was uh, sort of the jewel in the crown and we'll put uh, the Portuguese uh, uh, empire. And here is, here is Mozambique. This is a 1937 pictorial set. Um, rectangular stamps and a bunch of triangle stamps and a large, large range of uh, values showing the local uh, scenes from, from Mozambique. Here's Nyasa, not as many individual designs. This is a whole bunch of uh, uh, designs in which were used at three or four times each. Not quite as interesting as the Mozambique colony. Lots to collect there if you're interested in overprints. Uh, Mozambique, col Mozambique Company is interesting in its own right. There, that set I showed you, there are actually three or four different sets. And that is uh, the basic... Uh, story of the Mozambique and the, all the other uh, Portuguese colonies.